there's a series that we're, we, we started last week, and I, I, and I just encourage and challenge everybody to um, take your prayer life to the next level. And I, I'm, I'm calling this series The Church That Jesus Sees, and it's not an exhaustive series of every single thing that Jesus values or every principle, but there, there's several things that I just felt like I put on my heart for our church in this moment, in this season, that Jesus values in building his church. And when you follow the way of Jesus, and when you follow the things that he values, you might, you might want to answer it. It might be Jesus himself. <laughs> or it might be another election call or text, like I, we've all been getting 100,000 of them. I, I, I keep hitting delete and report junk, delete and report junk. I'm like, how many can they send? Good, good night. When you follow the way of Jesus, it leads to glorifying him, and that's what we were created to do, to glorify him and to worship him. When you lead, when you follow his leadership and you walk in the things that he values and that he highlights in his word, it leads to purpose in your life. It leads to fulfillment in your life. It leads to a life that makes a difference in the 82.5 years that you might have on this earth. And so I wanna talk in the second week on a church that serves, a church that serves. Jesus said this about himself in Mark chapter 10, for even the son of man... It's a word for the Savior, word for the Messiah. Even the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. If you're a follower of Jesus in the room today, you were called to serve. Ooh, that's, a, that's not a lot of amens because some of y'all are not doing it. If you're a follower of Jesus, you were called to serve people and, and him and God. There, there was a, a, a reality show that came out about 15 years ago, almost 15 years ago. We're getting old called Undercover Boss. Anybody remember that one? You're like, man, I hope they don't come to my workplace. <laughs> but if you never saw the show, it would look at kind of, the, the, the boss was trying to see organizational dysfunction and what they needed to fix. And maybe it was a senior executive in the company or whatever, but they would adopt a disguise and put on a wig sometimes or whatever. And they would interact with employees. They would... Uh, learn about experiences and the challenges, the, the positives, the contributions to the company, all the stuff that was going on. And at the end of the undercover uh, period that they had, the, the executive would reveal their identity to the employees that they worked with. And a lot of times they would reward people with a promotion uh, or maybe lay somebody off that was really mean <laughs> or uh, give them a bonus. They would fix issues, address things. And one of the examples I was looking at was a guy named Steven Klubeck. He was the uh, uh, founder of Diamond Resorts. And he went undercover and called himself Jack. If, I'm, if I pronounce his last name wrong, you can connect, correct me later. But he was trained by this employee named Randy. And uh, the guy was hardworking. The guy was really patient. He was really kind. And Randy, uh, in his earlier years, he owned a, an RV repair business and he sold it. And the purchasers weren't able to pay Randy and his wife the remaining $240,000 that they owed them. And, and through a series of events, they didn't get their cash and it was supposed to be their retirement. And Randy and his wife had to continue to work two jobs. And at the end of the whole uh, thing that uh, the owner goes through and, and looks at the company, he has this sit down with Randy and he decides to pay off Randy's mortgage, $150,000. And then he gives him another $50,000 in cash so that they don't have to work two jobs anymore and to help him step into his retirement and all that stuff. And, it, and it's always beautiful to watch a story of somebody using their authority or using their influence to make a difference in somebody else's life. And I thought about that this last week when, you, when, when authority and somebody's selflessness come together, the result is really arguably the most powerful form of love. It's the love of Jesus. And, and it's this mentality that says, I'm gonna lower myself in love before I just try to lift myself up to lead. And this kind of love, uh, I would describe it as one thing. I would call it servanthood. And... and the culture that we live in does not really lend itself to a, a biblical view of servant leadership or servanthood. You think about it, the, the, the voice within us, the selfishness within us naturally, the voices around us, it's, it's like, hey, what can you do to lift yourself up? What can you do to climb the ladder as quickly as possible? What can you do to just keep on grinding and, and, and make the next dollar? What can you do to move up that org chart? What, what does that look like? And there's a place to say like, yeah, I wanna grow my talents and I might, you know, my business, I wanna see it succeed and I wanna work hard, but we can get so carried away sometimes climbing and striving and, and making it about something that it wasn't really meant to be in this life. 
The way of Jesus, church, is regularly upside down from the values of our world. If you read the gospels long enough, you'll start to realize, wow, I thought that was in the Bible, but actually Jesus said the opposite thing. And in the kingdom of God, if you wanna go high, you need to first go low. Bible said this, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up, not you yourself. I, I've heard it said that if you're too big to serve, you're too small to lead. And I, I wanna take you to a passage today. If you brought your Bible, Philippians chapter two is what we're gonna walk through today uh, in the Bible. And anybody bring a Bible to church? It's the, the word of God, the, the, pow, the most powerful book, the, the only book that uh, you don't just read it, but it reads you. It, it cuts between bone and marrow. It changes you. The Holy Spirit, is, the author is present every time that you read it and you get in it and he's working. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. You just get a condo in heaven. You don't get a mansion. <laughs> Someone that's new is like, I'm leaving right now, this heretic. It's, it's a joke. Uh, verse three today, Philippians chapter two, this is what it says. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Here's a, here's a thought uh, that I wanna just reiterate. Believers are servants. If you're taking notes, you can write that down. If I'm a believer, I'm a servant. And, and Paul's statements that he makes to the Philippian uh, people, the church in Philippi, it comes at a church when these people are going through a lot of opposition. It comes at a church, to a church where they're suffering, where they've been going through some stuff and Paul's in prison writing this and just at the same time he's writing this, these people are being threatened, they're being mistreated, they're being disowned from their families and their organizations and their social clubs. It's a hard moment and Paul is saying, regardless of what's going on, you guys need to serve each other. And not only is he saying, hey, yeah, it's important to serve people that are not in the family of faith, but he's writing specifically to the church and saying within the family of faith, within the church, serve each other. It's interesting that whew, so often in the church, we treat it like a Walmart and in America today, we're fighting against consumer Christianity where somebody's like, they didn't sing my song today. I'm headed to the next church next week. They didn't do enough hymns. They, the music was too loud. The music was too quiet. They, this person said this to me. They didn't like my hair today. I'm offended. And you, and you go through churches like you go to fast food restaurants and spend too much money five days out of the week when you should probably pack your lunch once in a while and you're switching every second. Can I just challenge you? If you're on the church hopping thing, plug in somewhere and grow where you're planted. If this is stop number four, maybe you should have never left stop number one where you were planted and you got offended at something dumb and just said, I'm gonna be a part of the solution and not the problem. And I'm gonna dig in and I'm gonna be generous. And I'm gonna love people and I'm gonna serve some people. I'm gonna serve the Lord. I'm gonna lift my hand. I'm gonna worship him every day of my life and get plugged into the body and the community of Christ. That's part of the problem in America today. If somebody's like, I'm getting under your skin too early. But, but, but Paul is saying, guys, hey, serve each other. Not just when everything is fantastic in your nice city of Philippi, but when you're under fire, serve each other. I don't know about you, but I can so often use my own suffering as an excuse for not serving. I, I can so often say, well, I got a tickle in my throat, wife, and I don't wanna change the diaper, and she's probably thinking, well, I'm carrying another baby, and taking care of the baby and changing the, and she doesn't do that, but she could. It's my excuse. I, I can think of all of my own failing in, in marriage to serve. Lord, help me to be a better dad and husband. Notice how Paul refers to the suffering that's going on it, back in chapter one. Turn the page back to chapter one, verse 29 for a second. He says this to the church, for it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him. Paul is saying, God has given you the gift of faith to believe in him, but he's also given you the gift of suffering. Whew. He's inviting the Philippians to see their suffering in some way as a gift from God. Where they're saying, Lord, thank you that I'm going through some stuff. In fact, can I tell you, if you're a Christian today, you're gonna go through some stuff. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. But there, in the Christian life, there's some stuff that's gonna happen. You thought that it was gonna be rainbows and butterflies and, and everything was just gonna change immediately when you gave your life to Jesus. But instead, sometimes the persecution might get even a little worse. 
Sometimes in the early days, the enemy realizes that your soul was snatched out of hell and he wants to put you back there. And so he's gonna throw some stuff at you and you need to say, no, 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 God's grace is sufficient for me and whatever I'm walking through, it won't last forever. That's the good news. But unfortunately, there's gonna be something else that happens, but this is not the end of the story. Heaven's the end of the story. And so in the meantime, God, let your grace rule in my life. God, help me. I need your wisdom for this day. God, I might be going through something, but I know that healing is at the end of the line. God, I might have some problems, but I know that you have overcome the world and my hope is in you. I don't know how people do it without Jesus in our world. I need his grace every day. I need his grace just to go to Walmart or the better, bigger brother target. Some of y'all bougie people, just kidding. They brought back some of the, the, uh, the, in one of the targets I was in, I think it was the Lake Pleasant one, they brought back like the, some of the old stuff, like the ICs and the popcorn and all that stuff. So anyways, they heard the people complaining, I guess, I don't know. I'm off track. Verse three and four, Paul, he, he, he contrasts these verses that we looked at a minute ago, He contrasts three ways of doing community, three ways of relating to people in life. And the first one is this. You can write this down if you're taking notes. The first one is this, me versus them. You could use the word competition. What did he say? Do nothing out of selfish ambition. This phrase in the NIV, selfish ambition, uh, it can also be translated from the Greek to the word rivalry. It's this idea of living as me versus everyone else me versus the world, me versus whoever's around me. And how quickly and how easily in life can we fall into competition with people? If we're being honest, so many of us have struggled in different seasons with comparing ourselves to other people. Can I encourage you that comparison, if you let it rule your life, comparison will become the thief of your joy. Maybe, 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 for you, it's, it's, you think about your life group, and in your life group, it's like, well, that person's prayers are better. Whose prayers, I, they're, they're more spiritual, or whose marriage is better, or whose kids are better, and you don't know how bad their kids actually are at home. But, or, 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 or maybe we're, we do things sometimes that are not right, and we know they're not right because we're insecure, and there's this perception that, that well, my neighbor has it all together, and so I gotta have it all together, but you haven't seen the struggle behind the scenes, and we start to compare. And when we get stuck comparing, it eventually morphs into competing before we even realize it and we get consumed by how we can outperform other people in life. And Paul is saying, church, don't exhaust your time, your energy, your resources, your intellect, your talent just to get ahead of someone else in this life. Selfish ambition makes relationships all about running a superior race. I gotta be better than, smarter than, holier than, stronger than. We're really good at doing this morally as Christians. Well, we're not as bad as that family over there. I can't believe that they did this. Did you see what their kid wore on October 31st? I can't believe they let him have that costume. My God, my goodness, we are so much better Christians. Some of y'all did it in your mind. You didn't say it, but you did. I can't believe they gave their kid candy on. I can't believe they showed up to be a light to their community. They should have hid in their basement. It's a Romans 14 issue. You should read it. You want the real history of, of... some of our holidays, our church would love to send you some resources. Sometimes in American culture, we, we make things like scarier and more evil than they actually are. And I know that my Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof 365 days a year. One day is not gonna keep me hiding in my basement. I'm gonna shine my light every single day of the year, whether it's through giving candy or some other way. Paul says, take this mindset of having to compete or having to compare and throw it in the trash. The other thing that, that, that we can see in, in, in verse three that we looked at is there's a mentality of me above them. Nothing out of selfish ambition, and he says, or vain conceit. If selfish ambition makes life about running a superior race, vain conceit makes life all about being a superior race. I'm not talking about ethnicity, watch. Paul is saying do nothing out of a self-deluded, inflated view of self. Don't do anything out of that type of mentality. He's saying conceit usually begins by thinking that I am somehow a special case in the earth today. For whatever reason, I'm the exception. For for whatever reason, because of, uh, of some problems or certain trials that I've gone through or I'm experiencing right now or, or because of certain talents that I have, the rules don't really fully apply to me. God, you see where I, what I've been through. Give me a break here. That's vain conceit, it's me above 
the rest of the group. And unfortunately, again, sometimes people do this out of insecurity or out of hurt, maybe because they were mistreated at one point in their life and all of a sudden everyone else is the problem and they never take responsibility and they're always the exception in every situation or it's simply just a pride thing that we do. It's interesting though, in, in, in our passage, in our text, Paul gives a third way of doing relationships and it's the God way, it's me under them. Watch what he said again, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Paul's words here, um, they're a little bit radical. They're a little bit uh, un-American. I, I would suggest that this is one of the hardest things for us to do. Watch this, we, we Americans, in a lot of ways, we're all about equality often to our own demise in businesses in 2024 because people are getting hired that shouldn't even be doing the job. Some wacky factors, instead of somebody that, that learned what they needed to learn, it's just like, well, they look like this or whatever. Fascinatingly in the scripture, Paul doesn't call them to equality. In fact, when the New Testament is talking about community, whether it's Jesus teaching or the letters of Paul or the writing of Peter, there really is never an emphasis on equality. And before you get your, your, your diversity, equity, inclusion, undies in a wad, watch. <laughs> what I'm saying is emphasized in scripture is becoming a servant. The New Testament emphasizes not so much being equal, but being humble. It emphasizes not my rights, but rather my responsibility. A responsibility to lower myself in humility and in service to other people Paul speaks what I would kind of put as two different things. The first one is importance. He said in humility, value others above yourselves. I wonder if some of the things that we've seen in the last five, six, seven, eight, nine years in our country, 2020, if there were more people that said, I'm gonna value somebody above myself, if it never would have gone the direction that it went. Importantly, Paul, Paul isn't saying to us, value yourself less. He's not calling us to see ourselves as worthless or worth less. He's calling us to see others as worth more. Looking at others and saying, hey, you matter. I don't care what your background is. I don't care who you are. You matter to God and so you matter to me. You, you matter to me so much that, that, that I may not even know you that well yet, but I wanna help you and I wanna serve you because that's what Jesus would do. He also, there, there's an importance thing that he's talking about. There's also an agenda thing that he's talking. He says, not looking to your own interests, but the interests of others. We look around as people that are walking with God, walking with Jesus, and we say, who is it in my life that needs some help? Who needs some backup today? Who could use some reinforcements? Where's that person that, that I can come alongside today and say, hey, I know you lost your job a couple weeks ago. I'll fill up your gas tank today. Hey, I know you're going through this in your family. I'll pray with you today. Hey, I know that you got this going on. How can I come alongside you over the next couple weeks and serve you in your life? We need more people like that. Not out of competition, not out of conceit, but out of this continuous, unending consideration of other people before ourselves, me under them. What would a community like that look like? Maybe you've seen a, a, the org chart before in the place that you work, or you've looked at one and, and you see the hierarchy among the employees and there's all these bubbles with all these names and president, vice president, all these different things. And, and we can imagine where competition and conceit can show up in the workplace. More somebody becomes a supervisor, sometimes it means they become more of a jerk because <laughs> they might be tempted to see themselves as special or, or super important. Or someone else is, they're, they're on, in the same job as 75 other people and there's this competition. They're all trying to undermine each other and nobody cares about each other and they treat each other like trash. And I've even seen it in the church world. It doesn't usually go well for people. Ego causes division in the body of Christ. But Paul's vision is this community of servants walking with Jesus where everybody is serving everybody else. And even if the title or the role or, or whatever is different, there's this mindset of how can I serve somebody today? My pastor used to say that all the time. He'd be like, hey, hey how can I serve you? How can I answer anything? You, what do you need help with today? How, how can I serve you today? The, the world 
in the, the culture that we live in today, they, they know relationships that are marked by inequality and equality. And when, when you look into inequality, I mean, it's, it's relationships that they lead to oppression and they lead to exploitation and injustice. And obviously as Christians, we're gonna stand against that kind of stuff and, and stand with people that are hurting or the widow or the orphan. It's important, it's the heart of God. But, but then you look at equality and it's what's championed by the modern West and obviously it's better than inequality, but when we focus only on equality in a society, all become citizens, but none become servants. That's why the New Testament, when it talks about community, the focus isn't so much on this, but again, it's on humility. Paul said, in humility, value others above yourselves. In Ephesians 4, 2, Paul calls the church to community and he starts off all of it by saying, be completely humble. In 1 Peter 5, Peter writes, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. In relationships that are marked by what we would describe as inequality, service becomes a demand. Give me my reparations. But in relationships that are marked by humility, service becomes a decision. And it's powerful when somebody decides to serve in the Jesus way. Who in the world, though, would ever decide to do that on their own? Nobody, let's be honest. It's not in our nature. Nobody walks around. Your kids don't walk around. I wonder how I can serve my five-year-old brother today. I don't know, maybe they're saved and sanctified at three and they're really good at it. I don't know, but it's not in our nature to humbly serve, truly thinking of others above ourselves, not to get somewhere, not to get them on our good side, not to feel good about ourselves, but simply saying, I'm coming because I'm called to do it. I'm, I'm, I'm dropping in humility, me below them, because God called only the one who came from out of this world, Jesus naturally does that. And obviously Trump when he served fries at McDonald's. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm just making sure you're awake. Some of y'all perked up, what, what is it? You're texting. You're on Instagram. The only reason that real believers are servants is because we're rooted in a savior who serves. Immediately after Paul's called them to be this community that serves, he grounds that call in the person of Christ. Watch what he says in verse five. And your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Paul uses mindset a bunch of times in this chapter and in Philippians. And, and, and when you look at this word mindset, you look at the Greek, it's concentrated uh, on, on what's on someone's mind 24 seven. What are they focused on? What are they thinking about? And when Paul says have the same mindset as Jesus, you have to ask the question, well, what's on Jesus' mind? What was on his mind when he was walking the earth? What was, what was he thinking? What, what was he focused on? What was he concentrated on? And Paul gives us this answer so clearly. And I would say in a word, it's servanthood. It's love that showed itself in serving people. And these verses are some of the most important in understanding the nature and the work of Jesus. Go to verse six with me. It says this being in the very nature God, Jesus did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus knew his nature. He knew his identity. Jesus knew that he alone had the resources to do what needed to be done to save all that were hurting and broken and lost in the world. And so he used who he was, what he had, not for getting, not for grabbing, not for his own advantage, but for giving of his life. One scholar said this, instead of imagining that equality with God meant getting Jesus on the contrary, gave and he gave until he was empty, he thought of equality with God as open-handed spending even to death. He went from the highest place to the lowest. Jesus knew the nobodies, he ate with them. He ate with the rich, he ate with the poor. He cared about all people. He did everything he could to understand humanity. He walked with a lot of people. He became the lowest. Paul is explaining these words about Jesus to a Roman colony, the Philippian church, where people were extremely status conscious. They dressed like the Romans, they spoke like the Romans, they, uh, there were two main classes, there were citizens and there were slaves and there was a huge gap between them. And Paul is saying, guys, the one that you call savior, he went low and he became a slave. He walked in the shoes of the lowest and he knew their struggles and he knew their temptations and, and he knew their weaknesses. And, and, and as this servant, Jesus came to give and he started by 
getting people. He started by understanding people. He started by walking with people. He started by feeling what they felt. Church, we cannot fully give to people until we take the time to get people. It's hard to. It's hard to serve someone without seeing someone, without standing in their shoes. Jesus, he knew everybody and he chose that. On the night of his betrayal, think about how powerful this is. The night of his betrayal, he washes his disciples' feet. It's, it's kind of gross today. It was a lot gross back then. They had donkey doo-doo and all this stuff from their feet from the sandals. And literally in that day and age, that was the worst of worst jobs that you could do. And Jesus says, I'm gonna go as low as you can go and I'm gonna wash the feet even of the one who would betray me. One scholar talked about this moment of Jesus washing feet, and he made the point that there is no parallel in the history of the universe in any text or any ancient source that there is a person of authority that does such work like that. There's no record of any person like Jesus ever. There's no one like him. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. There was nothing that could turn him away. There was nothing that could stop his mission. There was no hurt, sacrifice, misunderstanding, opposition, nothing that would stop him. His love led to a Roman instrument of torture of the worst kind called a cross. His love said, I'll go to a cross for everybody. I'll go to a cross for the one that hates me. And Leslie or Jenny is mad because they got asked to sing at church in the youth service instead of the adult service last week. I made up the name, it's not somebody that I know. It's not service if it has a bunch of stipulations. Well, the church has to do it this way. I can't believe you would ask me to actually serve. I can't believe you. It's become about you at that point. There was a moment in 1941, World War II, Auschwitz concentration camp where uh, guards realized that a prisoner had escaped and they responded by randomly selecting 10 other prisoners that they were gonna kill through starvation. And one of the 10 cried out, my wife, my my children, they were with him in that camp and prisoner, prisoner number 16770, a German Polish Catholic priest by the name of Maximilian Cobb, who had already suffered a bunch of beatings at the hands of the guards he spoke up and he volunteered to take that man's place. They yelled, my wife, my children. He got arrested six months before that because he helped Jews escape. He was helping the the Polish underground. And throughout the following several weeks after he volunteered to take this guy's place, there were prayers and there were songs of praise that could be heard in this underground dark place where they were keeping all of the 10, where they were isolating them and starving them. And after a couple weeks, they were still alive and they got murdered by lethal injection, all of these 10 prisoners. And the priest was reported to have been conscious and he was very kindly compliant, writers said at at that time. And then they incinerated their bodies. This priest said, "I, I heard that guy, what he's going through and he, wants to be with his family, he chose to die that if some stranger might live, that's what Jesus did. Our text today shows us that Jesus' service, it required a decision from him, fully God, fully man, knowing his identity, he said, I'm gonna serve and I'm gonna serve without end. And that's really the trajectory of every Christian's life to follow the way of Jesus. Henry Nouwen wrote a book said Jesus has a different vision of maturity from what our world would see as maturity. His ability and willingness to be led where you would rather not go, that's maturity. The way of the Christian is not the way of upward mobility in which our world is invested so much, but of downward mobility ending on the cross. And it might sound morbid or masochistic, but for those who've heard the voice of the first love and said yes to it, he says the downward moving way of Jesus is the way to joy and the peace of God, a joy and peace that's not of this world. Watch what Paul continues in verse 9, 10, and 11. He says, God, therefore, because of all this, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven 
and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father when Jesus decided to serve it was an act of dependence on God an act of faith an act that says at, at, at some point every knee will bow every tongue will confess and he depended on the Father for three different things that were going to happen the first one is that God would reverse the curse of sin and the curse of death that everything he was accused of every disaster every injustice every mo- mistreatment even death itself all that was lost in the life of Jesus Jesus would eventually be restored as he was raised and he was seated at the right hand of the Father, loss would lead to gain. I want to encourage somebody in the room today that the loss that you've experienced in your life or even right now, because of the power of Jesus as you walk with him, it's only going to lead to gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Whatever I go through, God will redeem. The good news is what I'm going through right now, it will not last forever. The Father also gave Jesus this reaffirmation that his name is above everything every name. When Jesus completed his servanthood, the father looked at the universe and with a smile on his face, he, on his face, he said, this is my son. Do you see the family resemblance? That's the kind of God I am. This self-abandoning, fully submissive slave who died on a cross. If you've seen him, then you've seen me, the father says. Paul is saying to serve, to give, to be in submission, to sacrifice, to be misunderstood, to be betrayed, to be condemned, to speak up for truth and get mistreated, to be killed. That's not just for sinners. That's at the very heart of who God is. And submission, self-abandonment, sacrifice, they are not signs of weakness, but they're signs of power. Any weak man can say, I'm not gonna serve, I'm in it for myself. Maybe in your family, there's ways of doing things. Like you grew up and your dad's like, this is the Wilson way. This is how Wilson's do it. This is the Smith way. This is how we do it. In my family, I'm going to tell my son, this is the Metcalf way. We, we root for U of A basketball. We, we put peanut butter on our waffles. We don't like the Dallas Cowboys. I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's the Metcalf way. But maybe, maybe you have things like that that you can remember as a kid. And God is publicly in this moment of history letting the world know as he seats Jesus at his right hand, he's saying, this is how our family does it. And he lets everybody know that his name, Yahweh, the name above every name, that belongs to Jesus. And he reaffirms Jesus' sonship and his divinity in that moment. Maybe you remember in 2001, 9-11, you remember where you were at, what you were doing, if you were alive or you weren't a baby. And you can think about some of the people, the actors, musicians, all famous people, they were putting on the fire department hats. Remember seeing some of those pictures? The NYFD hats. And and what they were doing in that moment is they're saying, hey, we want to honor them, but that's what I want to be like. I want to be like one of those firefighters. I want to be like one of those guys that that some of them gave their lives in that moment. There's there's this thing. And, and, And it was happening in that moment and in a somewhat similar way in the aftermath of Jesus' humiliation and crucifixion, when the Father raises him from the dead and exalts him at his right hand, it's as though the Father is taking off his hat that says Yahweh and placing it on Jesus and saying, this is who I am like, this is who I am. You wanna see me? This is the picture of who I am. You wanna be like me? You wanna know me? Look at Jesus and become like him. There's a reversal, a reaffirmation, and an everlasting rule that comes through Jesus that at, at, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. What's, what's the end result of the reversal of, the, of this affirmation of the son that all creation, those who mocked, those who hated, those who killed, those who betrayed, those who turned their backs on Christ are gonna be subdued and vindicate. All will come to see that he has every right and rule over all of the cosmos. And it's only a matter of time. This is your day to make a decision. Which team am I on? Team Jesus? What's my response to to God doing what I couldn't do for myself? I think my response is to serve like Jesus and say, God, there's a lot of days where I don't do it. And and so I need your help to go low, to serve people and to serve you. There there, there was a challenge last week to take your prayer life to the next level. I want to challenge you to take your servanthood to the next level. I want to challenge myself to take my servanthood to the next level. Humble ourselves to the point of a community that serves like never before. This kind of love, that's what sets us apart from the rest of the world, church. In a polarizing season, polarizing world, all the time now, servanthood stands out. It glorifies God. Say, well, how can I serve? Well, maybe start in your family. How can I serve better as a, as a father, as a husband? How can I serve better as a wife, as a, as a mother? How, how can I 
serve in, in my church family. Maybe, maybe it's as simple as taking one of those cards out of the back of your seat for the first time and saying, man, I realize that there's a need in the kids. I realize that, that I can smile and wave at someone and greet them at a door so they feel welcome in, in, in this place for the first time when they've never met Jesus and seen someone with so much joy in their life. Maybe there's, I realize that there's a need in the youth ministry or, the, or, or, or showing up for a reach weekend and being a light to the people of God, or, or I, can, I can hold a camera. I, 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 can, I can serve a coffee cup. I can do something. I, I can use my talent because I, I was a touring harmonica player, guitar player, whatever. I, I, I can do something to serve in, in my church family. I don't, I don't know what that looks like for you. You do. God's given everyone gifts. The scripture makes that clear. Maybe it's serving your neighbor across the street that has a sign for the person that you're not voting for. Woo. Maybe your service could soften their heart and change them and they meet Jesus and they realize that they were never voting for righteousness and it was your servanthood that changed everything. I don't know, I, I would consider that today. I, I hope that you will say, God, how can I serve you? And, and hear me, don't forget that it's not about us because people all the time get offended because it's like, well, I didn't get to do it the way that I'd wanted to do it. it. Well, it's not about you. God, you didn't plug me into the new ministry that I wanted to start to the online Minesweeper players. Like, well, I don't know anyone that's playing it anymore. The greatest thing that you could do above all of filling out a card or serving your family better is, is on top of all of that is the decision to follow Jesus and to say, I, I, I wanna make you the Lord of my life.